I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Kelly Mabry. Uh, Dr. Mabry is a craniofacial speech pathologist at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and she's also the assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University. Um, Dr. Mabry's research interests include craniofacial anomalies, medical genetics, pharyngeal functions, the pharyngeal, sorry, 22Q11 deletion syndrome, feeding and voice disorders. She's a medical volunteer for Operation Smile and a passionate advocate for children with craniofacial disorders. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Mabry. Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Well, I wanted to start off by saying I'm excited to be part of Dr. Brown's education series and uh, thanks Sandy for facilitating this talk. Um, I will be talking today about Pierre Roban sequence um, feeding management across interventions. So for today, what I'd like to do is um, have the participants be able to identify normal and atypical feeding anatomy, um, to also understand the relationship between feeding and respiration, because this is one of the paramount issues when we're working with children with Roban sequence. Also to identify normal and abnormal feeding and swallowing patterns as well as commonly used feeding techniques for special populations such as children with Pierre Robin. Um, we will talk about uh, Pierre Robin sequence and subsequent airway effects and also be familiar with transitional feeding stages for this population. Um, so on this slide you'll notice this is a uh, picture of the infant oropharyngeal anatomy and one of the main differences between the infant anatomy and the adult is that um, we have a different angle between the oral pharynx and the esophagus, uh, which is more of an oblique angle, whereas with an adult, it's more of a 90 degree angle. So what you'll notice here is the velum, which is this area right here, actually has very close approximation to the epiglottis. And it's this approximation between the velum and the epiglottis that allows a child to suck, swallow, and breathe in synchrony. Here we see the different phases of swallowing, and um, we have the oral phase, which is the prep and transit phase, which is A and B. Um, and then we have the pharyngeal phase, and then we have the esophageal phase. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these phases. So if we start off with the oral preparation phase, uh, in a typical infant, what we would be seeing in this phase is um, rooting latching initiation of the suck. This is where they will extract liquid from the nipple and the coordination of the suck swallow breathe synchrony begins. Now in children with PRS, uh, for our talk today, I will be um, assuming that this child with PRS has the traditional triad of features which would include um, micrognathia or um, small chin. Um, we could also see uh, cleft palate with this population and glossoptosis, which is where the tongue actually falls back into the airway. So with this in mind, if we look at the first part of this um, phase, which is the rooting, this is typically unaffected in PRS infants. We do see that they still have that rooting reflex and they are able to root towards the um, source um, nipple. However, all of the subsequent phases are affected. Um, latching is affected because as they go to latch on, the differentiation between the upper and lower arches makes it very difficult for the child to actually um, keep that nipple in their mouth. And the fact that they have a cleft palate makes it unable for them to be able to then um, have a negative seal, which will help with that latching process. Um, again, when we see the initiation of the suck, what typically happens in this stage is that there's less suction and more compression at this point. So in this early stage, the infants, a typical infant, would have their tongue and they would actually compress the nipple up onto the roof of the mouth as they got ready to then pull their tongue back and express the liquid with a combination of that tongue motion and some negative pressure from suction. But for children with PRS, that becomes very difficult, both the initiation of the suck and extracting the liquid from the nipple, because they are unable to compress against a palate that is not there, right? Depending on the size of their cleft, that can become problematic. 
and also they don't have um, the ability oftentimes to strip that nipple because of the differentiation between the upper and lower arches is so significant that the tongue is actually sitting so posterior in the mouth that we really can't even get the nipple over the tongue and I'll show you some pictures later on of what that looks like. And then when we talk about the coordination of the suck, swallow, breathe, synchrony, that's affected as well. Um, one, because the suck, all of the features that we have talked about previously is affected. The swallow becomes problematic because the tongue, glossoptosis, interferes with um, the swallowing initiation. And um, as fluid forms and as a bolus and it goes to go back, what triggers that is a uh, collection of fluid in the voleculae and that becomes affected as well. So this is just a diagram of what we just talked about. One of the things that we'll see again, um, this is where we would see a typical occlusal pattern. In the children with PRS, this would be the upper arch here, but the lower arch you see would be due to the retrognathia is um, significantly further back. And what that ends up happening is the tongue then is further back. This would be a, the glossoptosis. And um, you'll see there's very limited area here, passageway for the fluid to come back. And the fluid, instead of being compressed here in this area in the, in the oral cavity, gets actually propelled up into the nasal cavity here and coming back down this way. Okay. So this is a, um, an image of classic uh, paroband sequence presentation. This first image is a sag sagittal um, in utero image, and this is showing um, the area here where these are the lateral palatal shelves that have not yet uh, fused together because the tongue is actually sitting right up in those palatal shelves. This is the vomer bone. Uh, typically, the tongue would um, fall, come down out of the nasal cavity, and these palatal shelves will come across and fuse. Um, in perpendicular to the vomer bone. Here you see example of the significant retrognathia in this case. And if you look into the infant's oral cavity, you'll notice that this is actually the cleft. What you're seeing right here is a cleft. And the tongue is sitting behind the posterior fascial pillars. So the tongue is actually sitting back into the pharyngeal cavity instead of being forward. So as we talk about the, um, the phase of transit, one, uh, as the bolus is collected and formed and sealed between the palate and tongue, the PR in, PRS infant cannot do that. Um, also anterior posterior movement is affected. And when the liquid is um, to collect in the voleculi, which triggers the swallow, that is affected as well. Here's an image of what glossoptosis looks like. This is a, um, image that we're looking at, an x-ray image. This is the area of constriction. Here's the base of the tongue and the pharyngeal wall. And if we look through a scope, this is the same image from a fibroactic scope that's looking from a superior view down. And what we should be seeing in this image here is, you know, the passageway, the oral pharyngeal passageway, uh, that the pharynx, we should be able to view at this point the vocal cords. But what we're actually seeing is a complete obstruction due to base of tongue. I have a video that I'd like to show you briefly, and this is an example of a mild to moderate glossoptosis. So let's get this going. There's my mouse. Okay. What you're seeing in this image is we are has, uh, through nasendoscopy, and we're looking down the pharynx, and we're looking at the, um, here is the epiglottis. And right here are the arytenoids. We're looking at the vocal cords. This is actually the tongue base is sitting, pressing right up against the epiglottis. And while this tongue in this image is not actually, um, I'll just pause it right here so you can see. This is a good image here. We have the vocal cords, the arytenoids. Here's the epiglottis. The tongue will actually be filling in this whole space in here, um, which is part of the area where the fluid is to collect to trigger that swallow. And in this case, that is not going to happen. You see the bulk of the tongue there. So now in this phase, which is the pharyngeal phase, the next thing that happens is the soft palate elevates and that keeps food from entering the nasopharynx. So we know with children with PRS, due to the cleft palate, that that will not be able to happen. Um, swallow is initiated at the vec and that is affected as well. 
The tongue moves back and up to facilitate that swallow, and because of the posterior tongue position uh, due to the glossoptosis, this becomes problematic as well. The larynx moves up. This is affected as well because we know that the tongue is attached to the hyoid bone, which is attached to the larynx, and um, that affects that overall swallowing function. Now the vocal folds come together at this point as the larynx moves up and the pharyngeal muscles start to contract and the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes. These are a triad. They often happen in very close uh, proximity to each other. Now depending upon the amount of glossoptosis there is, sometimes we find that that is unaffected and sometimes we find that this is actually is affected. But oftentimes we'll talk a little bit more about how when it comes to um, breathing versus swallowing, the breathing always takes precedence over the swallowing, and the system will actually shut down the swallowing mechanism to facilitate the breathing. And so many of these um, features, the pharyngeal muscle contraction and the upper esophageal sphincter relaxing, uh, become problematic as well. Finally, in the esophageal phase, peristalsis moves the food through the esophagus. Um, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, allows food to pass through to the stomach, and then the lower esophageal sphincter then returns to a closed state to prevent regurgitation. Really, for this population, the effect of the cleft palate, um, which decreases the amount of pressure in the system, is most likely what is the most significant factor for this. Honestly, there has not been um, lots of research to look at the relationship between that decreased pressure and the esophageal phase, but I, I think that this is something that, um, that we are looking at for the future. This is a nice model that was um, developed for looking at how the relationship is between the swallowing functions. And if you look at this model, um, everything that's in black is a typical um, function. And what we would be looking at here is the red would represent what it would look like for a child with um, Pierre Robin sequence, specifically looking at tongue position, which is more posterior. This would be the base of the tongue, giving us uh, this amount of space in the back for breathing and swallowing. But this actually gets reduced to very limited amount of space. And if we look at the angle of the epiglottis, that oftentimes um, is, ends up being over here because we have the bulk of the tongue in this area. So one of the things for us to consider for overall development of feeding is that you, it's very important to consider the development of the oral motor feeding and swallowing in order to fully understand why infants have feeding difficulties. Um, this is not typically just one cause. We usually find that there's an interrelation between the factors. And disruption of the development can lead to long-term feeding issues that continue on through toddlerhood and school age. So if we look at the overall development of feeding from a typical perspective, we find that um, the suck is present in utero as early as 15 to 16 weeks. And we also find posterior to anterior movement of the tongue is observed. The lips are loose and they're not actively involved until um, three to six months. And the suck is functionally mature at about 31 to 32 weeks gestation. Um, the gag and pharyngeal response is observed prior to 30 weeks, but it's functionally mature at about 31 to 32 weeks. We find the swallow is present in utero as early as 14 to 17 weeks, um, and we observe it in infants at 28 to 29 weeks. And then we talk about finally our suck-swallow-breathe coordination, and we see that as early as 31 weeks, however, um, not fully mature until 37 to 38 weeks or beyond. So when we look at um, the development of feeding skills, we find non-nutritive sucking um, is very important for the development of feeding skills. And an example of this would be sucking on a pacifier or um, sucking on a hand, a finger. And typically for non-nutritive sucking, it looks like about two sucks per second in a healthy term infant. This is something that encourages us calming state regulation, it improves oxygenation, and it's an early sign of central nervous system integrity. Um, it is not, however, a predictor of success with the nipple feeding, and many people feel that if a child is, you know, doing well with a pacifier, then they should do well with um, nutritive feeding. However, the demands of actually controlling the bolus and protecting the airway, especially with our Roban children, um, show us that this pacifier sucking, this non-nutritive sucking, really is not a good predictor of success for nipple feeding. <laughs>
How this differs from nutri nutritive sucking um, is that we usually find for nutritive sucking it's a one suck per second and we find a one to one to one correspondence between suck, swallow, and breathe. Um, we'll find sucking bursts which are, that are typically 10 to 30 cycles before a pause. Um, and this is in our healthy term infants. When you're attempting to start your feeding and swallowing assessment, it's very important to look at the child's state. And we are looking at this before, during, and especially after feeding. Um, it's important not to just focus on the feeding part of it, but we want to find a baseline beforehand. And then we also want to look at how they're doing after that feeding because that is a, um, a, an event that they are engaging in that oftentimes we find uh, difficulty even up to 10 and 15 minutes after the feed, especially if they're having some airway compromises. We will be looking at postural control. Um, we want to make sure that they can maintain physiological flexion for swallowing and breathing. Um, and this also becomes problematic for this population because oftentimes we need to change our position for our row band children to enable them to have a better airway access. Um, and so we have to do lots of work around um, posture. We're also looking at respiration and their work of breathing. Again, we want to look at their baseline and then we want to see how they do with non-nutritive sucking and compare that to nutritive sucking. And we want to listen when we're looking at their respiration. We want to listen for dynamic airway problems, whether or not we're hearing any strider or stertor, are there any fixed obstructions in the way. And, and then also finally physiological control. We want to look at all of the indicators of how they're doing, heart rate, respiration, color. Um, if there is a problem, what is the context that we find? For the oral pharyngeal reflex response, we want to make sure that we see the rooting gag suck and swallow response. We want to make sure that we um, assess that nutritive suck. And for the swallow, we want to look at the timeliness of the initiation, visible signs of um, the swallow or difficulty with swallow, and audible signs. Some of the breathing stress signals that we find with swallow um, breathe discoordination would be respiratory fatigue, um, tachypnea, where they start to become tachypnic, nasal flaring, chin tugging, uh, where they're actually tugging, um, tugging their chin up and down, catch-up breaths, or high-pitched strider. Um, any of these features we would look and, um, and really fully assess further what's going on in terms of their ability to maintain their respiratory effort with that swallowing event. Some swallowing stress signals that would reflect a discoordination would be gulping, drooling, uh, gurgling kinds of sounds, multiple swallows to get one bolus down, coughing, choking. Um, there may prob be problems that exist without symptoms, such as silent aspiration or any desats or color changes. Um, so ways that we assess this, um, first of all, we would do a bedside feeding assessment to make sure that the child is ready to have a, a feeding experience. Um, when we look at a structured evaluation, we would do a MBS or a modified barium swallow evaluation. And um, it's important to note that when you're doing this evaluation, the MBS should not be the infant's first experience with a feed. Um, they should have some feeding experience before doing this study because if this is their first feeding experience, the results are not valid in terms of how the child may actually do. So this MBS evaluates the oropharyngeal swallow function. It gives us a risk or presence of aspiration or penetration and modifications that can be done to reduce or prevent those episodes. We do this with the speech pathologist and the radiologist and again, the infant should have a comprehensive clinical bedside first. Um, this is different from a barium swallow, upper GI, or esophagram. We are looking for um, the specific function of that suck swallow breathe synchrony um, for the swallow event. So here's an example of a healthy term infant, and we're going to look at what this looks like. So you find here's the nipple in the mouth. One thing that I'd like you to notice is that the nipple stays relatively stable. Um, with each compression, you'll notice that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the tongue, the swallow, and um, the suck. And um, I'll go back just to show you this again. The material in dark is the barium liquid. We'll go back to this again so that you can watch as the liquid goes down. You're looking for each swallow. It's coming down here. I'm going to try to get a 
stop it right here. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually as this area, the esophagus um, is open, we're seeing that the epiglottis is forward, the liquid is going to pool the voleculi and then that will trigger the swallow. This one is a relatively fast one to see, but this is what a typical swallow looks like. See the nipple being kind of held there tightly. Now, um, this image is an image of a child who has Roban sequence. Um, we've tried, if this image is, it, it will show you, it's a little bit more difficult to see this particular image, but two things I want you to note. The first is that I want you to watch the nipple in the child's mouth. And if you remember the previous image, we saw the nipple stayed relatively uh, still, in, but it was being compressed. The other thing is, is that as you watch the fluid go down, we will actually see lots of fluid collect into the nasopharynx. So this is the nas nasopharynx up in here, and here's the nipple in the mouth. The tip of the tongue is actually here, which is sitting behind the nipple, a little bit under the, the very tip of the nipple. But look how much more movement you're seeing in the nipple itself compared to um, the previous image. And that's because the child has a cleft, and so as the tongue goes to compress up, there's nothing really for that nipple to compress against. And then what you'll find is that, in one second, you'll see this barium coming up. This is barium that's all filled up into the nasal cavity. Um, so this isn't, um, the swallow here is um, not as effective, but I really wanted you to focus on what's happening up in this stage for this image. So in the healthy term infant, again, the oral motor reflexes are integrated, the airway is stable, state regulation is well supported by the environment and feeding, you know, infant is predisposed to feed and they're prepared to do so. So when we talk about interventions, it's important to remember that the interventions should be predictable and there should be continuity. You know, um, using the same nipple, hold the infant the same way, supporting the parents, establishing and following a feeding plan. This is one of those cases that oftentimes the more people that are feeding a child, it becomes more complicated because everybody does it a little bit of a different way. When we talk about timing and pacing, um, the timing and pacing may be prescriptive but often varies depending on the infant. And tilting the nipple in the mouth versus removing the mouth depends on the infant's needs. Oftentimes when a child needs to be paced, in other words, they do well with a certain flow but then either the flow is too fast or they, they get ahead of themselves in the swallow, you can actually pace them by just tilting the nipple away from the center of their mouth and um, so that breaks off that pattern of expressing the um, fluid from the nipple. And it's, uh, for these children, it's better to do that than it is to take the nipple out, put it back in, take it out, put it back in, because each time we put the nipple back in, they have to reorient to the feeding experience. Keep the nipple still to respect the infant's need to breathe and swallow. Um, if you remember in the last um, image that we saw, the nipple moves around quite a bit in a child who has PRS and for two reasons. One, because there's such a differentiation between the upper and lower jaws that they can't actually use the, um, the jaw to compress and clamp on the nipple to hold it in place. And the other thing is, is they can't build up negative pressure or suction to hold the nipple in place. So every time that tongue is moving around, there's much more movement of that nipple. So when you're intervening and feeding, it's important to hold that bottle very firmly in the infant's mouth to facilitate that nipple staying still. So in terms of positioning, what does it do for the swallow? Um, many times with infants with PRS, we will um, attempt to feed them in a sideline position. Um, this oftentimes helps to open up their airway somewhat, especially if they have a significant glossoptosis. And what we look for there is trying positions that we find the best amount of airflow and the least amount of stress for the infant. So um, if we have a child who is sitting in an upright position and the glossoptosis is really impacting that swallow, we might try a side semi-reclined semi position. And if that's not working, then we would do a full sideline position. Um, we also have to focus on the breathing patterns. Oftentimes, if a child is um, having difficulty with the breathing component, they might swallow, 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 and then now you're starting to see either they become bradycardia 
where they stop breathing for those moments while those um, those um, incidents of the swallow and then they get themselves into trouble and so it's very important to focus on that breathing pattern and also watching tongue position and looking at the swallowing it's important to look at the monitors but it's also very important to look at the child as well you want to be able to recognize the signs of a child in distress from um, eyebrows moving up avoiding turning away um, a change in color anything like that would be something that you would really be focusing on now when we talk about up upright versus sideline the issue becomes does the tongue really move out of the airway some people feel that it does and some people feel that it, it doesn't and I think this is one of those issues where it really is a case-by-case -case basis and it depends on the individual infants anatomy but it is certainly something that we always try that sideline position to see if we get um, increased airway one of the other things that we have to consider is flow rate so this is critical for safe and successful fleet, uh, feeding we know high flow rates can flood the pharynx, trigger repeat swallowing, leads to interruption of breathing, um, and higher potential for penetration of fluid into the larynx or aspiration of fluid into the trachea. And um, so defining that optimal flow rate for each individual child is a trial by uh, error actually process. The other thing we look at is nipple selection. Now, for children with PRS, again, one of the things to keep in mind is that this, the retrognathia actually poses a problem for arch alignment. And so when we're looking at the shape and size or length of the nipple, um, oftentimes these children do much better with longer, firmer nipples because we would like to try to be able to get that nipple over their tongue if possible. And um, with the retrognathia, the tongue is so posterior in the mouth that that often becomes very problematic. The other thing is, is that the nipple should be rather firm. Um, as if you remember in that one image where we saw the nipple moving around quite a bit, the nipples can actually become crimped and um, angle upwards into the nasopharynx when the arch is compressed down. And because of the deviation between the two of them, it bends the nipple in the mouth. Um, then we have the whole issue of the cleft palate to consider where you know this is an infant who is not going to be able to build up negative pressure and we would be looking at a, um, a nipple that would facilitate um, that process so in the later slide I'll show you some examples of different nipples now for interventions um, it's important to do um, look at the infant um, an infant dr driven cue based approach is often very beneficial because in this way we're really focusing on what the, the needs of the infant are in this particular situation. We want to make sure that we are able to address the triad of um, features that the child has because they all affect the swallow in a different way. We want to support the caregivers. Um, if I am the only person that can feed this infant, that is not beneficial. It doesn't empower the family and it doesn't provide the infant with multiple opportunities to have successful feeds. Nipple selection is important, positioning, which we already talked about. Um, surgical options. Now, this child's um, management of the PRS will be a combination of issues between their respiratory needs and their feeding needs. Um, three common types of surgical options that we've seen for this population are tongue lip adhesion procedures, MDO, which is mandibular distraction osteogenesis, and trachs. And then we also have enteral feedings. We have nasogastric tubes, which is a relatively short-term solution, um, PEGS, um, which are tubes that are considered if oral feeding cannot be accomplished by one month, or NJ tubes, which are considered when reflux is an issue or there's a delayed gastric emptying problem. Here's an example of um, some of the nipples that we are currently using. So the Haberman are special needs feeder. Um, they have a regular or a mini. This is a clear silicone reservoir that has a one-way valve. Um, it has a slit in the nipple that corresponds with a flow rate. And so if the slit is in a horizontal position, the flow rate is slow. If the slit is in a vertical position in relationship to the infant's nose, the flow rate is much faster. And um, again, this bottle would be considered a squeeze assist bottle where you can actually squeeze the reservoir and um, present a bolus of fluid to the infant. Um, the important thing about feeding with a squeeze assist bottle is that one, 
you have to really monitor the infant. Um, as you squeeze the bolus, you have to be um, doing that in response to their suck attempts. And the other thing to consider is that for every different person feeding that infant, they are going to squeeze that bottle in a different way. So we talked before about how important it is for continuity of the feeds. This becomes even more important in this instance. Another uh, nipple system that we use is the pigeon nipple. Uh, the picture that you're seeing on the screen is the um, older version. It's a yellowish kind of a color. Uh, they recently changed uh, and uh, redesigned that nipple probably within the past six months or so. It is now a clear silicone nipple, um, but it still works basically the same way. It has a Y cut. The top of the nipple is relatively firm. The bottom is softer, but this is a non-squeeze assist nipple. As the infant compresses this nipple, they receive a bolus of fluid. Um, Mead Johnson Cleft Palate Feeder is a soft bottle that's intended for single use. It has a n long nipple with a cross cut. It is also a squeeze assist, um, but you actually squeeze the entire bottle. That, red, that bottle is very soft. This is a bottle that was used um, in the past. There's not many facilities that continue to use this bottle, but it is a bottle that you may see. The Bionics bottle is um, another bottle that we might use depending on um, the infant and how much ability they have or if they, especially if they have the Pierre Robin sequence, but if they don't necessarily have the cleft that is associated with it. Um, this is, has a single hole, it's a variable flow rate, there's a straw in the nipple. And this is good for therapeutic feeds, so we can actually have this bottle um, where the child is doing more of a sham feed or a therapeutic feed where they're getting very minimal bolus amounts, um, but they're getting practice at doing that suckling. And, um, and Dr. Brown is currently developing a cleft palate nipple. Um, the nipples come in various uh, flow rates, and right now there's um, trialing a one-way valve system with a traditional Dr. Brown bottle, so we're looking forward to seeing how that works. In terms of problem solving, um, one of the things that we're looking at is oftentimes when you go to do these feeds, you find that if the infant is frantic during the feeding, the things for us to look for are have we waited too long for the feed, is the flow rate too fast, is the infant expressing air hunger, meaning that they're not getting enough opportunities for breathing, um, and are they having state regulation difficulties. Um, if you notice clicking or smacking sounds, this is often a signal that they're not maintaining suction against the palate or they may have a very aggressive suck due to adaptation to a system that is not delivering a flow rate that is um, large enough for them. When we see a disorganized sucking, we have to look at the, the child holistically as a whole. We want to see if they have, it, if they're disorganized in their body. We can often take a moment, re-swaddle them, reorient them to the feeding session. Um, is their tongue disorganized? We may need to do some therapeutic feeds before we do traditional feeding. And then again, flow rate. Um, and then uh, tongue positioning, again, which we spoke about, um, gravity. Is it better to have them upright? Is it better to have them sideline? We may find that sitting upright helps them with flow. However, it, uh, because of the glossoptosis, it affects breathing. And so this becomes a real puzzle to try to figure out. Now with PRS, um, Oftentimes, if we're looking at Pierre Robin sequence, which is oftentimes a compression of the lower jaw in utero, the resolution depends on expansion of the oropharyngeal airway, and mandibular growth often is rapid um, afterwards if it is related to a compression issue. The growth that we're looking for is forward and downward, and again, the growth centers are in the mandibular condyle. How much does the mandible catch up is one of the questions that we need to address. We don't know going into this whether a child has Pierroban sequence, which is a sequence of events due to um, compression of that jaw in utero, or if this is a syndrome, whereas the jaw is perhaps micro instead of retrognathic, and so the catch-up growth may not be there. So we have to look at that. Can we afford to wait for catch-up growth? How much does the mandible catch up? I wanted to give you a short case study to a show um, some of the management options that we might use for a case of a child with PRS and uh, specifically looking at the feeding and the management of the airway. So this is a case of um, our little patient EH, this is a new, newborn born term with Roban sequence, observed in the NICU, very poor feeding, respiratory insufficiency, and after six weeks there was no improvement. 
um, many options were offered and this child ended up having a trach and a G-tube. And um, the same child at two had adequate mandibular growth, the palate was repaired, um, but the child still continued to have their trach and G-tube. And although they were trying to have the trach removed, this child continued to have severe obstructive apnea on a plug sleep study. And so we were still deciding what to do with this patient's uh, when we found out that this family actually was pregnant with another child who had a diagnosis of Roban sequence in utero. At this point, with one child having Roban sequence and now the next child having Roban sequence in utero, the thought is switching from that this is a Roban sequence case to more of a syndrome where we may be looking at a jaw that is small and going to stay small. Now, the trach was extremely difficult for this particular family they did not want to necessarily go through that experience again. Um, this child, the sibling AH was born with an even smaller mandible than their older sibling. And so the family and team was um, wanted to avoid the trach for management and they decided to go with a mandibular distraction, um, which we'll talk about in a second. I wanna talk a little bit more about mandibular distraction. but. Initially, one of the ways to help airway is just by doing positioning. So we would look at prone or sideline position to see whether or not that made a difference. That would be our first line of action. Oftentimes, centers will do a tongue stitch to keep that tongue forward and see if that makes a difference. We look at oxygenation, um, if they might need some uh, oxygen um, at bedside to help with that. Nasal CPAP, if we're looking at for continuous pressure flow or many options for artificial airway, oral airway, nasopharyngeal airway, laryngeal mask airway, or intubation, which in these patients can be very tricky due to the retrognathia and glossoptosis. So again, what can we do? So um, when we talk about our non-surgical long-term options, basically, you know, these babies stay in the NICU or they go home with positioning, oxygen, and monitors. However, the cost of low-grade hypoxia and excessive caloric consumption by breathing for the developing brain is unknown. However, this is an area that um, you know, we are very interested in. Um, we do know some of the costs, however. Um, from surgical airway options, again, we have glass, um, uh, glossopexy, which is the tongue lip adhesion. Our team does not find this is uh, very effective. We don't use this as a, um, an option for our children. Um, mandibular distraction osteogenesis is a technique that is gaining in popularity for this population because not only is it improving the airway, but it's improving the feeding as well. Trach is uh, more of the traditional treatment for children who need that airway support, um, where airways are priority. However, feeding is not addressed. When we do a trach, um, that helps with the airway, but it does not help with the feeding. So the trach itself is not without risk. You know, anesthesia is difficult in these patients. Having a trach makes subsequent surgeries much safer, however. Um, it does require skilled care at home. It allows the patient to go home, um, but you know uh, they can go home within two to four weeks, but there is mortality of a trach, which is up to 1% reported in the literature. For a trach, you know, airway management will not address the feeding problems associated with glossoptosis and the retro or micrognathia. And infant feeding experiences are critical foundation for feeding development. Anytime we have reflux, vomiting, or pain that influences the relationship between, between eating and the desire to eat, that can set up long-term feeding difficulties. If a child has a trach and then also needs a G-tube, oftentimes the enteral feeds are given over a 12 to 24 hour period, which disrupts the normal hunger cycle. And the transition to oral feeds are often delayed due to a disassociation between eating and hunger. Um, and then what happens is self-regulation and the desire to eat are often affected. So some things to consider for this population would be doing bolus feeds instead of continuous feeds and trying to have those bolus feeds timed for a typical feeding cycle. Or if a child is doing bolus uh, feeds but they are not able to actually have oral feeds yet, you can do oral stimulation timed with bolus feeds, regulated oral stimulation during continuous feeds. Um, so there's ways that we can go about doing this, and the goal is to try to have this child on as normal of a feeding cycle as possible and getting the stimulation.
Um, so things to keep in mind is you cannot simply withhold feedings to induce hunger. The infant does not even realize they're missing something. This is very important. Appetite and hunger follow culturally set patterns, so you need to be aware of the patterns of that particular family that you're working with. And oftentimes professionals tend to place a greater emphasis on caloric intake rather than nutritional balance. Um, so this is something that we need to address as well. So transition to oral feeds needs a systematic approach. Now mandibular distraction, if you choose mandibular distraction as an option, what typically happens is the mandible is gradually elongated over a period of two to three weeks. A mechanical device distracts the two portions of the mandible approximately one to um, one and a half to two millimeters a day. As the portions of the mandible are separated, new bone is formed. So here's a diagram that shows where we actually um, place the cut. So you would have a, a cut here. Obviously, the, the alveolar nerve is something that we do not want to cut, and so there's great care is taken to um, work around that. Here's a sample of what a device looks like. This is an internal device. Um, this is where it's attached to the bone on either side. Here is this, the device. Um, this is actually, this portion is outside of the skin, and this is where we actually turn the uh, screw. This is an example of an external device. Are, we found that we have very good success with the internal devices, so we don't use these external devices, but I wanted you to see what those look like. Again, here's another schemata of what um, we're actually looking at. This would look at the internal. Now this is um, the actual case study that we were talking about before. This is AH, and this is um, the intra-op um, image of her distractor device being implanted. And so you see the cut here. Um, the device is placed on either side. We have the distractor here. So when we do the mandibular distraction, there are um, three phases. The lag phase, um, this is the phase immediately following the surgery, which allows for the initial osteotomy healing. It usually is about 24 to 48 hours in infants, but could be five to seven days in older children. Um, the distraction phase is the next phase, and this is where we advance one to two millimeters a day. Again, it's limited by the alveolar nerve. We don't want to advance too fast because we want to give um, the system the ability to gradually elongate. And then that can be done once a day or divided throughout the day. And then we have the consolidation phase, and this allows for solid healing. Um, the distractor stays in place, and it provides fixation. This is that same case, and this is showing you the image of um, this was pre-surgery. You can actually see that um, not only are we having retrognathia, but we're having micrognathia as well. And then we have the image, the post image, and this is what that alignment looks like. Okay. So if we go back to our patient of um, AH, so they had the diagnosis of micrognathia and cleft palate. Um, more likely that this was a syndromic case. Means harder management, harder to manage the airway, less effective catch-up growth. She had persistent increased work of breathing. She had a polysomnogram with an AHI, which is the apnea hypoxia index of 45.5 per hour, and the normal is less than five. So this was in this severe range. And so the family was having going to have a trach, but as you see, they actually changed their mind. So when we did um, the polysomnogram again, this is our index of um, sleep apnea severity, and it accounts for the number of pauses in breathing during sleep. Um, we look at that as a ratio, and again, 0 to 4 events per hour, 5 to 15 events per hour um, would be mild, moderate is 16 to 30, and severe is greater than 30 events. This is an image of this particular case, and this is pre-surgery. So you can appreciate here the um, retrognathia right in this area. This is that same infant. And there we are deciding what to do for this little one. Um, so we actually decided to do the mandibular distraction, and it does require lots and lots of coordination between the um, inpatient management team, the family, the craniofacial team. Okay, here's the distractor device in place. In the post-op course, she was in the PICU for about sedated for six days. She was advanced one centimeter a day, tube-fed during this time, no problems noted. 
uh, very successful extubation. Her, she had a um, polysomnogram that was conducted at the end of her distraction phase, and she went down to 1.9 um, EHI, which is great. Her feeding advanced rapidly from 30% PO to 60 to 70% PO in three days following her um, distraction, and then up to 100% PO by nine days post extubation. And she was uh, distracted about one centimeter or more over the next nine days. So this is her final result. This is 15 days, and she was advanced two centimeters. So here's a pre and a post. So you can see the image here, what that looks like. Now just briefly, I wanted to do a quick comparison. Um, we had another child that was born, but with much less obvious airway issues. This child had very few DSATs while in the supine position, but obvious physical signs such as retraction, head pulling, um, the oxygen levels were between 99 and 92 percent during the 12-hour challenge, and this is where we have the infants stay on their back for 12 hours and uh, monitor their oxygen levels, but decreased significantly to the low 80s during every single feed. So while this baby was able to do well for the um, just airway breathing, when we challenged them with a feeding task, they went down. The HI index was 27.1. Um, which is significant. They were considering putting a PEG tube in for enteral feeds, but the family chose mandibular distraction. And this child was 100% um, PO feeding by day 9, and their post-op AHI was 8.6, uh, which is still m greater than what would be a normal range, but then a follow-up AHI two months later was within the normal range. Okay. So um, an ongoing study at our center is looking at the timing of achieving full oral feeds following mandibular distraction. And we looked at a cohort of 11 infants to date to get a sense of um, what the feeding expectation should be for this population. And the age range for our um, subjects in this study were uh, four months to 10 months. Um, this shows a graph time to PO since M from the time that they had their mandibular distraction, the time that they reached the, their goals of oral feeds, and looking at age. Um, and what we found was that the average days to oral feed was um, looking at about 13 days to oral feeds. Um, and I'll show you the next table, which will show you the actual subjects. Um, so the average distraction distance for our population was 13 millimeters. The average days to full PO from the day of their mandibular distraction was 12.9 days. However, the average days to the full PO feed from first oral feed following the mandibular distraction was 5 days, 5.8 days. And what that means is that um, from the date of surgery, these children are often intubated for the first couple of days, and then they're weaning off of their pain meds. And so we don't actually start feeding them for probably three to four days after they're, um, they're extubated. So we found that a better way to really evaluate how well the children do is to look at them from the time of their first oral feed. And again, from the time of their first oral feed, these children were 100% PO feeding by day 5.8. Um, last thing that I want to talk about for this population is, so now we have the mandibular distraction done, and these children are now able to use a traditional type of cleft nurser. We use the pigeon bottle, and um, they did very well with that. And then what we need to think about is transition to cups for these children prior to their palate repair which um, typically for Roban children could be delayed until 15 months or greater due to airway um, concerns, but with this population we're able to actually do it um, closer to the 10 to 12 month age range that we use for children with clefts who are non-peer Roban children. And so we start cup transition at about seven to eight months. Um, we do continue to use the pigeon nipple post-surgery for about a four week period for hydration and healing, but we like to get them on the cups as soon as possible. Um, cups that we use, we use open cups, um, tilty cup, and then nubby, and I'll show you examples of this. Um, the tilty cup is a cup that we have found good use with. It, it enables us to have um, fluid presented. You can actually squeeze this cup somewhat to present some fluid, but yet it has a cover. There's no valve in this cup, which is something that these children um, have difficulty with because they can't build up suction. Um, and so these have a snap-on lid, and they have a nice plate design in them so that the child doesn't have to tilt their head back 
um, extremely far in order to extract any of the liquid. Um, the Nubby Cup has a Easy Spout Gripper Cup that we've also found very useful. If you look at this cup, it actually works by compressing this nipple down and these two slits flange open, very, very similar to the Haberman Special Needs Feeder. And so we found good success with this as a follow-up feeder as well. So um, in closing, I think that um, management of these children with Piero band sequence should look at the relationship between feeding and airway. We can't look at feeding and airway separately. We need to look at them together and, um, and monitor the child. And every child is different, so we need to really focus on their individual feeding needs while following some of these general guidelines. So thank you very much.